The following recording was made in September of 1969 in Franklin, New Hampshire. The speaker is Baba Ram Das. It was related by a Sufi master that when he was a youth, he wanted to attach himself to a teaching master. He sought the sage and asked to become his disciple. The teacher said, you're not yet ready. Since the young man was insistent, the sage said, very well, I will teach you something. I am going on a pilgrimage to Mecca. Come with me. The disciple was overjoyed. Since we are traveling companions, said the teacher, one must leave and the other obey. Choose your role. I will follow. You lead, said the disciple. If you know how to follow, said the master. The journey started while they were resting one night in the desert of the Hejaz, it started to rain. The master got up and held a covering over the disciple, protecting him. But this is what I should be doing for you, said the disciple. I command you to allow me to protect you thus, said the sage. When it was a day, the young man said, now it is a new day, let me be the leader and you follow me. The master agreed. I shall now collect brushwood to make a fire, said the youth. You may do no such thing. I shall collect it, said the sage. I command you to sit there while I collect the brushwood, said the young man. You may do no such thing, said the teacher, for it is not in accordance with the requirements of discipleship for the follower to allow himself to be served by the leader. And so on every occasion, the master showed the student what discipleship really meant by demonstration. They parted at the gate of the holy city. Seeing the sage later, the young man could not meet his eyes. That which you have learned, said the older man, is something of the nature of discipleship. The disciple must know how to obey not merely that he must obey. The question of whether to become a disciple or not only comes after the person knows what discipleship really is. People spend their time whether, wondering whether they should be disciples, since their assumption that they could be a disciple if they wished it is incorrect. They're living in a false world, an intellectualist world. Such people have not yet learned the first lesson. That's from Idriya Shah's book, The Way of a Sufi. And that particular story is among the writings of um, Kidr, K-H-I-D-R. There's another Sufi story. Of a Sufi sage who was attending a the darshan of a fakir, Indian fakir. And he yelled out in the middle of the darshan, There is fire here. Fakir looked around saw no fire and he continued his presentation and after some time Sage yelled out, there is fire here. Fakir looked around, saw no fire, went on with his presentation.
third time they said, Yara, I can smell smoke, there is fire here. Fakir got terribly irritated and he got up and he lifted the sage up and flung him out the door. The sage walked in back in and he said, See, I told you there was fire here. <laughs> Today I wanted to um, speak about the drama that would unfold for many of the people who have spent the summer, a good part of it here, in, in the presence of satsang, in the presence of a community of seekers as they change their time-space playing field. And um, I thought that was sort of the responsible thing to do. And just as I was getting very heavy about this responsibility, I got this card from Marilyn Guten. A number of us just keep keeping me straight by sending me little messages. This is from Thomas Merton's Thoughts in Solitude. As soon as a man is fully disposed to be alone with God, he is alone with God no matter where he may be. In the country, the monastery, the woods, or the city. The lightning flashes from east to west, illuminating the whole horizon and striking where it pleases. At the same instant, the infinite liberty of God flashes in the depths of that man's soul and he is illumined. At that moment, he sees, though he seems to be in the middle of his journey, he's already arrived at the end. I thought, well, it'll all happen the way it's supposed to happen. I thought of all of the trite things I think of under these conditions. It'll all happen the way it's supposed to happen. It's all happened already. It's an unfolding of karma. Um, then I thought, watch out, don't up-level too fast. 
stay at the level at which you get into a car and you drive out of here, out of this land, where this land still exists in the illusion. It's nice to say New York and, and this hill are the same place, but if they're not the same place for you at that moment, saying it doesn't help. It, is, it helps a little, but it's still an intellectual place. And your heart still beats anxiously. And there's still a tightening in the throat. And there's still a paranoia that creeps in. And for many people, that's the level of the illusion <coughs> and the strength of it at this point. When I came back from India, I was, I had noticed a change that had occurred, that after the beginning of my work in India, when I went to a town nearby, I got pulled back immediately into my discomfort about being an Indian holy man garb and so on. And then by the end of my journey, I could go into the middle of Kano Place in Delhi, which is the most worldly place in India, and walk through the streets barefoot and in my gown and have everybody feel good and light and not feel any kind of paranoia that I was putting anybody on because I felt so much in the spirit. So I saw that change. But then I thought, well, America's going to be a pretty heavy trip. It's going to be tricky. So with my head creating that fear, I headed back for America. Honolulu, first stop. No, Tokyo. Tokyo, I immediately went to a Zen monastery and hid away for a few weeks. I got off the plane in Tokyo, looked to neither left or right, got immediately on the train, so to speak, and went off to the monastery. Then Los Angeles. And then Boston, and then I came right up here, went into a cabin. And I thought, well, this first leg hasn't been bad. I've been through three airports. I've had cold salads since I wouldn't eat cooked food in a restaurant. And a number of restaurants and planes. I've talked with my father, and here I am in this cabin, and I'm still pure. I haven't gone under yet. My head was there was an under place. And I protected my virginity in every way I knew how. And the protecting of it was very cumbersome, but it felt very, very necessary. And then as time went on, I sort of tested the relaxing of these kinds of rules on myself. I saw what I could get away with. What I could get away with without going under. In my head of out under. And I saw that my spiritual connection was much stronger than I thought, that it wasn't that vulnerable, that if I if I ate a piece of toast made by a person of dubious spiritual merit, I didn't immediately lose all my 
connection with the spiritual hierarchy. They didn't rip it away from me because I had and that if I missed my asans for one day, my body didn't suddenly become like concrete. And uh, that if I uh, looked at television for an evening, I didn't suddenly get the desire to go out raping and looting. <laughs> and I got a rather cocky feeling. Well, I'm clearly over the hump. I have definitely made it into the fourth chakra. I thought quietly to myself. I mean, I didn't go around broadcasting this. But I felt a certain kind of, uh, ha, ha, ho, ho. <laughs> Isn't this going to be fun? I mean, I can really play back in my, with my worldly desires, and it's all going to be all right. And so each day I opened another little door. And then I don't know which day it was or which door it happened to be, but there suddenly got to a place where I knew that I was not the same guy who came back from India. and that I was more vulnerable than I thought I'd been. Now my guru would ask me, um, is there anything you want? It's a great thing for a realized being to ask you. You know, it's like the genie coming out of the bottle. Well, I want, ah. Uh, and I said, I don't want anything. There's nothing I don't want. He said, think about it. it must be something. You want to fly? No, I don't. <laughs> there was nothing I could think of I wanted, you know. and I didn't want to know the future. It wasn't any desire to want anything. I had thought I'd want all these things if somebody would ever ask me that could do it, but it turned out I didn't. That's the way it turned out, you know. I mean, I, there I was sitting there, and he asked me, and I didn't want anything at that moment. So I thought about it, and I thought for weeks about it. I mean, you know, the opportunity was now passed, but I knew if I went back and said, you remember you said if there was anything I wanted, I might still eke a want out of it. Because when I was away from him, suddenly there were thousands of things, and I thought, do I really want that? You know, He really took me on a trip. And I was reading the Tulsi Das version of the Ramayana, and I was reading about Ram, and... There was a point in which Ram offered this man whatever he wanted because the man had done a great service. And the man said, let me just never forget my love for you. So I went charging back to the guru. <laughs> I said, uh, you remember? You said I got everything I wanted. <laughs> I said, well, I know what I want. I want not to lose vishwas. I want not to lose faith. I mean, I'll take anything else you can hand out or it is or is handed out, but I don't want to lose faith. Because I know as long as I can sit in this nice warm place where I know how it all is, it's all cool. It's only when I get into that horrible paranoid place where I've forgotten how it all is that it gets rather rocky. Because from that place I can get into the whole trip to India, the guru, the whole spiritual trip seems like a complete hype of the mind and all those memories were hallucinations and it was all junky mentality and I might as well settle down and get straightened out and what I need is a good psychiatrist. <laughs> and it's been an unfortunate trip and I've certainly sucked a lot of people in with me because I had a very powerful mind. Ooh, <laughs> I really scare myself with it. That's the profane take. What's all this Eastern nonsense? What are you teaching my son? How do you know it works? Can you give him a better life? 
What right have you... Are you really happy? Mm. Really? <laughs> you certainly still look hung up to me. Well, at any rate, um, so he smiled. So I figured, well, I got it made, see, because he's granted me this wish. He didn't say he was granting it to me, but he just smiled. Maybe he was smiling at a particularly tasty belch. I don't know, but he <laughs> smiled, and I thought, well, my wish has been granted, and I'm, in, I'm home free, you see, because no matter how corrupt I get, I'm not going to lose faith. <laughs> now I can test. I can really let go. It was the same feeling of uh, wildness that I felt when I got a message last fall. I was planning to come back here and spend a year, and I got a message from Bhagwan Das, my guru brother, saying, Maharaji said that you ought to return to India in two years, not for two years. And then I got a further letter from a friend in nearby town who said what Maharaji actually said was, Ram Dasji will be here in two years. So I thought, wow, you imagine that somebody who knows the future has just, that's the first thing I've ever known about my future, that I will be at a certain place in two years. That means I can throw myself in front of automobiles and everything because <laughs> he's told me how it'll really be. He unfortunately didn't tell me which form I would be in. <laughs> and from his place, you know, who knows? <laughs> So as I say, I don't know which door it was or which gate or which loosening up, but suddenly I could feel when I would recite the words of my teacher to me or when I would reflect on my inner place that, that I was like one veil away. A veil had somehow descended. And I panicked completely. I lost the faith or it went underground, or I thought, wow, or what a roller coaster this is. And I immediately fled into the solitude of my cabin. I rejected all people. I hid and I did my japa ferociously, and I sang holy songs, and I prayed, and I did my asanas, and I did my pranayama, and I promised to be good forevermore. <laughs> and slowly, 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 I found my way back. And I thought, whew, that's what I thought. I thought, well, I'll stay a little closer to home. <laughs> and then I went out, and the pull of the world was quite strong and seductive, and everybody said, you're such a high being. Mm -hmm. Everybody lulled me into an assurance that I couldn't possibly fall. I was definitely beyond that. And wouldn't I just come by for supper and... Couldn't I just be around to, to bless their child and take a little wine? And um, I know you go to bed early, but come on, I, we've invited these people over who really are so eager to just have your audience. Would you mind staying just an extra hour? Well, it's all seems so inconsequential. Why not? Mm -hmm. I mean, they look at you as if you can't fall, and you look into their eyes, and you see, and it seems all right. So. And Maharaji must be protecting me. He must be safe. And again the veil descended. 
And again I panicked, and again I rushed through all of my sadhana and my purifications, and again I rent the veil, and again there I was. Here I was. Here I am. So I started to get cocky in a new way. See, I can risk having a veil. I don't have to get scared. I can be hung up and say, well, look, I'm hung up, but I know if, like, tomorrow at 2, I'll start to get straight, because I know I can get straight. See, I don't have to get scared if I get covered with this illusion, get caught in the melodrama. I don't have to worry, because he's not going to take away my faith. He, he, was, he did do that thing, so it's all right. So then what that led me to do was when I'd get in, where I knew that veil was there, I'd say, well, that's just one veil, you know. I mean, I can clear that away any time. And after all, there's really not time at the moment to stop. So I'll just keep going because, you know, I can always later on, I'll, I'll set a week aside like, you know, later and I'll get myself straight. And then I got to the second veil. <laughs> where I kind of forgot, you know, I even got to a place where I said, well, there's no veil. Or I got so far away from the place that I almost, you know, it was like a memory, and then I started to question the validity of the memory, and then I scared myself again, and so I rushed back. How far can you go from your hole, you know? Looking for what? <laughs> and I would say that uh, my two years in, in the West have been sort of a, this drama. This drama. Of obviously being pulled by many, many worldly desires many desires that pull me into my senses and into my thoughts, pull me into interpersonal dramas, pull me into, uh, you know, all kinds of sensory experiences, food and luxuries, stuff like that. All of which have nothing intrinsically wrong with them except that they are wrong in my head because I am attached to them. That is, I want them. I get pulled towards them. It's like the root beer phenomenon that I go through. It's one thing if you're sitting down with people and they come and they say, here, drink this, and they put root beer in front of you. Then you drink the root beer because that's the thing at that moment, unless it's something that is really destructive to your particular sadhana. It's another thing to walk to the refrigerator, open it, and take out the bottle and start drinking. That's a different level of drinking root beer. Nuss. <laughs> 